Uh, my name is Ben Faber. I'm a farm advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, where we grow avocados along the coast, as well as mangoes, fajoa, citrus, and um, what we're going to talk about is drought strategies for avocados, but this, this is, uh, the principles will all be pertinent to other evergreen perennial subtropicals like citrus. Um, we'll start off with some big wordage. Uh, this is from Nigel Wolstenholme and Tony Wiley, who described the avocado as a residual survival strategy of a late successional K-selected small gap colonizing mountain cloud forestry. That's a lot of wordage for basically a, a tree that is fairly long-lived, um, grows in an environment which is uh, uh, drought-free and pretty much um, free of any other uh, uh, problems. Uh, it, is reliant on rainfall to leach salts out of the root zone. Um, and one of the problems we have with growing avocados and other subtropicals is that we're really highly dependent on winter rainfall to leach salts from our prior irrigations out of the root zone. And um, when that doesn't happen, we have problems with salinity damage. So basically, avocado and subtropicals are not adapted to hot, dry climates. They're in the case of avocado, it's shallow rooted. 80% um, of the roots are in the top 18 inches. And it has a very, very low salt tolerance. Um, and especially the time of the year of flowering when we've had uh, uh, summer irrigations and fall irrigations and in years with low uh, winter rainfall, we've had winter irrigations and salt accumulates in the root zone and the avocado tree reflects that damage that you can see. Um, drought and salt tolerance go hand in hand in California. Many of our waters, especially along the coast, are well waters which have relatively high salinities and even um, in Southern California where Colorado River water, we do have problems with boron chloride sodium and total salinity. And so the issue here is that um, normally Cells have a high salt content and water flows into the cell and then is transported up the, the stem of the plant to the leaves. And this is also carrying nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and so on. But when we have high salinity in, in the root zone, this is outside of the root, water actually moves out of the root into the surrounding soil to um, dilute the salts. Uh, avocado, um, this movement of water out of the root zone occurs at uh, 4 decisiemens per meter, which is about 2,500 part per million salinity. And we have what's called a yield function, which is basically as salinity increases, either as decisiemens per meter or parts per million, yield remains fairly steady until about 1 decisiemens per meter, and then it starts dropping in a fairly linear fashion to the point where um, you can have significant yield loss at two, between two and two and a half decisiemens per meter. Now, that <laughs> two to two and a half decisiemens per meter is a fairly low tolerance for salinity, and many of our uh, well waters do have uh, um, salinity in excess of that. Uh, one of the mitigating factors of, of the salinity in our, in our coastal waters is that it's often dominated by calcium. And calcium is an essential nutrient. Um, essential nutrient in the sense that um, it counterbalances the sodium that's in the soil. So um, the th thing about salinity in soils, it's not homogeneous. It, it varies. And in the case of microsprinklers, we have water coming out um, immediately below the microsprinkler, and we have a low salinity. So the salinity here goes from a light color to a dark color. And depending on the wetted pattern, we can have relatively high salinities occurring uh, on the margin of the, um, of the wetted pattern uh, to the point where it exceeds that two and a half decisiemens where we're starting to see yield loss. So what avocados and, and other trees do is they accumulate their roots in those zones of soil zones where the salinity is low. You tend not to find high levels of roots, it's sort of um, uh, pruned by the high salinity. Um, so you'll see a very uneven pattern of, of, of brooding when you have these microsprinklers. 
So here is an example of a typical research trial that was done by David Crowley at UC Riverside in a sandy soil down in San Diego County. And so here we have 0.75 decisiemens per meter going to 2.9 decisiemens per meter. So each of these bars at this point represent a different ir irrigation event. So as soon as water, the salinity diminishes and then it will increase slightly, you get a flush that occurs with the um, salinity that's moving out of the, the, the drier root zone and moving into the um, uh, environment around the root. So we have a decrease in salinity that slowly increases to 2.9, which is a, a, a value where you can actually see some yield decrease. We're also measuring this as soil water potential, and so zero is fully wetted, going to 427 centivars. So the salinity decreases slowly, and then it diminishes um, so that we have adequate water for the plant. And so we can also measure this in volumetric water content, where we have it um, fully wetted. It's 37% volumetric content, diminishing to 22. Now this is a sandy soil, so we're going to have very uh, relatively low volumetric water contents in the soil. Whereas if you go to a loam, you can often find close to 50% as a volumetric water content when you have um, total water availability in the soil. So not only is the tree affected, leaves affected, fruit inf affected, but um, also calcium. Um, so depending on how water is managed, calcium uh, uptake can be um, more than adequate for meeting the needs of the fruit, or it can be too low. And here's one of the consequences of, of a um, poorly managed irrigation system that occurs in a drought, where we're looking at um, uh, discoloration within the flesh of the, of the avocado, and as the calcium concentration um, increases, the amount of discoloration decreases. And this is also true for anthracnose, which is a fungal infection. As the calcium increases again, um, the incidence of, of the severity of anthracnose diminishes. So um, drought and salinity are affecting the, the nutrient content of the tree as well. So how do we approach drought strategies? Well, um, you've got to set priorities. You've got to decide what's worth saving and what's worth sacrificing. And across an orchard of 20 to 40 to 80 acres, you'll always find places that um, are, uh, have a lower um, yield. And you know, those should be some of the first places that you uh, decide to withhold water. Uh, so basically, you want to be irrigating the productive blocks that you've got. And uh, our micro-sprinkler systems and drip systems are really tinker toys in a way. They, they you know, you, you repair them and you fix them and pretty soon you've got uh, coyotes in there chewing on things, you've got gophers chewing on them, you've got pickers in there kicking things over, and you have the natural um, clogging that occurs with, even with a, a good filtration system. So um, fixing and maintaining the irrigation system is really critical and you can make significant savings in water just by, by maintaining the irrigation system. Um, also, um, there are critical periods when um, uh, water stress is going to be more problematic. So basically for most subtropicals, the period of flower to fruit drop is the most critical and uh, if stress occurs at that period, um, there will be more significant fruit drop. Now, Dave Goldhammer, um, in work on navel orange, has actually found that um, you can compensate in a way for navel oranges by making sure that you have adequate water, um, full application of irrigation requirement in, in the fall that can make up for a, a spring stress. So there are certain differences amongst um, the different subtropicals. So you go out and you analyze the grove. Are there areas that have cold temperatures, low-lying positions where they're more affected by, by cold and um, uh, flower and leaf drop? Are there areas that have excessive salinity? Are there areas where there's uh, uh, high soil pH? Um, most subtropicals cannot contend with high soil pHs and um, you have reduced yields in those areas. So, you know, go through the orchard and find out those areas that have low production. 
and then irrigate the, only those areas with a good production record. I can't emphasize um, irrigation system maintenance, um, checking the poly hoses um, where damage has occurred. Um, flush, flush. Did I say flush? Flush those lateral lines. There's, even with the best filtration, you do get eventual um, sediment uh, appearing in the lines. And the only way you can get rid of that and prevent clogging of the emitters is by flushing. Clean filters and repair sprinklers. Um, it's not uncommon to go out to an orchard and find all of the sprinkler lines buried under leaf system, leaf drop, and um, the, the irrigation lines are all buried under, under roots. And <laughs> that's a real indication that system, um, system maintenance is not being done. Distribution uniformity. Okay, so a good distribution uniformity is 85%, and that means 15% of the irrigation emitters are not getting the average. 85% means 85% of the emitters are putting out the same amount of water. Um, so if you have 85% DU, that means 7.5% are getting more than the average, and 7.5% are getting less than, than the average. And the, the problem with this is that you tend to run the system at the higher rate in order to compensate for the, for the um, trees that are getting the, the, the lowest water amount. And um, in compensating, you end up adding about 15% more water. So that's 15% um, that could be saved. Um, poor distribution uniformity is caused by plug sprinklers, line breaks, and poor pressure regulation. Um, so here is an example where, um, this is a true example that comes out of San Diego on a, on a sandy loam soil where it was determined that the trees needed 128 gallons of water plus 10% uh, um, leaching fraction. Uh, so that would be 166 gallons at 85% uh, DU. Now as the distribution uniformity diminishes, you have to put more and more and more water on to compensate for the, the low quarter that's getting the least amount of water. So this basically could be saving um, uh, over 120 gallons of water um, when you have a DU of 0.5 or 50%. Now when you go to the hillsides where uh, avocados are grown, this is not un an uncommon figure uh, to have. Um, Easily systems, when they're new and well-designed, they can have an excess of 85% DU, but after running for a few months or a year, the DU diminishes because of clogging and um, various disturbances of the system. So get the distribution uniformity up. Here's an example of a good uh, uniformity at 90% DU, and you see some variation here. And here's a distribution uniformity of 60% DU. Now these are, um, these are actual captures made from an emitter from an orchard, and you see the variability. Now, you can assess the irrigation system efficiency. Um, you can use the Irrigation Mobile Lab program, which is often a um, program run by the Resource Conservation District, but often uh, irrigation, uh, irrigation districts offer, offer these um, uh, evaluations. And then they'll make uh, recommendations um, to improve pressure regulation on lateral lines, um, actually consider using pressure regulating sprinklers, and then a, a regular program of system maintenance. So once you've got the, your, your irrigation system, the mechanical part of it fixed, uh, you need to decide how to do proper scheduling of irrigation. And this is both the frequency and amount of water applied. Um, they go hand in hand. Um, and here's an example from a website, avocadosource.com, where you can actually put in the reference of apotranspiration from the California Irrigation Management System, a crop coefficient. You put in your distribution uniformity, the leaching requirement, the number of emitters per tree, um, and the size of the acreage. And it'll spit out how much water to apply per tree per day or, or the period since the last irrigation, the actual watering time that you should run, the total water requirement for the whole grove, um, and then you can um, put in 
if you have an allocation amount, for example, many irrigation districts now are, have cut back on the amount of water that is being delivered to growers, and uh, it'll tell you what the shortfall is. So you can do the weather-based systems, as is the California Irrigation Management System, and here's an example of one of their weather stations that goes through a, a um, calculation to determine how much water would be required. Uh, and then there are private uh, programs that um, do a similar calculation to the CIMIS system. Or you can actually have what's called an atmometer, which is basically a tensiometer inverted. It's got a ceramic cup and then a, this is a, um, a guide that tells you how much water has evaporated from that surface. And, and these are all very similar systems um, that determine how much water has been used by the, by the the crop since the last irrigation. You can also use soil-based systems, um, resistance blocks, capacitant blocks, tensiometers, um, and these are, are telling you exactly when to irrigate. They, they're not that good at telling you how much. That, that amount is uh, ascertained after several irrigations, and you find out that when the tensiometer reads um, 30 centibars in this soil, it means it's gonna require 180 gallons per tree um, since the last irrigation, and the same thing goes for the other um, soil-based probes. Uh, we currently don't have any good um, plant-based probes that, um, uh, that are really efficient, uh, effective with the, um, the grower community. We, we use them in, in science, but they tend to be delicate instruments and um, require multiple readings. Um, uh, so they're, they're not as well based. We're basically looking at weather and soil based uh, measures. So then how do you decide what to keep? Um, you need to go through the crop in the case of avocados. We've got root rot infected trees. We've got um, trees that are affected by uh, crown rot and citrus. We've got root rots. We've got gamosis. Um, so figure out which trees are suffering. And in the case of avocado, even if you do get fruit in this tree, the fruit's gonna be exposed to the sun and sunburn. So you're not really gonna get a crop. So come through and cap off these trees um, because you're not gonna make any profit on them. Uh, sun blotch trees, um, this is a, uh, a viroid that affects the, the fruit. Um, you get scarring and discoloration, which discounts the fruit significantly. It affects um, the bark. You get this alligator type skin. Uh, ideally, what you want to do, this is going to be an ongoing problem. Ideally, you want to remove the trees and cap off the sprinklers. Wind prone, uh, prone areas. Um, we get Santa Ana conditions. Um, Santa Barbara, we get what are called sundowners. And the Marginal trees, the trees on the edge of the orchard, typically get too much wind and they drop fruit, um, but they do protect the rest of the orchard. So you can cap the sprinklers on these trees, not remove them, and keep them to protect the rest of the orchard. And then mulching. Mulching can reduce evaporative loss from the soil surface by about 25%. This is an expensive process to basically spread, oftentimes the mulch is relatively inexpensive or free, but there's a lot of labor associated with, with spreading it. So you wanna put this on the most productive areas and this is to gain, gain some um, evaporative loss. Tall trees, um, we can stump these or scaffold them down to six to eight feet and then whitewash to protect the bark to prevent sunburn. You can basically save about two months of irrigation um, where you can cap it off. There, you've got this very, very large root system now that can um, uh, access water to a smaller leaf volume. And um, in, in a couple, three months, you can start gradually increasing the water. So you, you can have some significant water savings by um, scaffold or stumping. Then thinning the grove, that's removing every other tree. Um, you can remove every other tree and cap off the sprinklers where that tree used to be. Um, and then slowly uh, increase water to the remaining trees. Uh, one of the things about most older orchards is that 
basically the root zone of this tree is in this root zone, is in this tree, and it's one giant root zone. And so um, if you remove every other tree, you still have some roots from this tree here, some roots from this tree here, and you're gonna have to um, change the sprinkler pattern, um, make it a wider pattern to um, keep the, the remaining roots alive. And then pruning can be done. Um, however, removing half the foliage does not reduce water use by half. Um, you basically have to go below 65% uh, ground coverage uh, from shading. Um, but if you reduce the size of the tree, um, the full grown tree that's 30 feet down to 10 to 12 feet, 15 feet, you easily can reduce um, water application by 20 to 30 percent. Um, this brings more light into the canopy and tends to increase flowering and more fruit set. And it also increases airflow, which uh, reduces the amount of uh, fungal damage to fruit. So the best we can hope for this year, uh, 2014, is more rain for next year. We really do rely on rainfall to leach the root zone of, of accumulated salts from um, prior irrigations. Um, and there really is no substitute for rain. Um, additional water that has salt is going to be putting more salt on. So let's hope for more rainfall. So with that, uh, I conclude this presentation. Um, and thank you very much.